well, for our uh, second to last presentation of the day, I'd love to welcome Liv Erickson uh, from our good friends at Mozilla, um, who's going to talk about multidimensional computing accessibility in the age of XR and AI. So please give it up. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Liv. Um, and I'm excited to talk to you today, uh, as Dylan introduced, about what I'm calling multidimensional computing accessibility, uh, specifically within the context of XR and artificial intelligence. And my, my hope is that um, what this can help do is shift our mental model from consuming technology as an individual to producing technology as an individual. Um, a lot of us here do work in building technologies, but as you'll hear from me in just a moment, I have, uh, I'm excited to share an ambitious goal for what this might look like uh, in the future. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm Liv. I work at Mozilla as the Innovation Ecosystem Development Lead, uh, which means my role is very cross-functional and cross-disciplinary. Uh, I've been working on spatial computing and artificial intelligence technologies for the last decade in roles uh, that span software development, product development, business community and marketing. Um, as well as in policy advocacy, so I've worn a lot of different hats. Before this role, most recently, I was the director for the Mozilla Hubs team, which has come up a couple of times so far throughout this event, and I will talk a little bit about in my presentation today. Um, and my current work focuses on enabling open source movements around emergent technologies, and more specifically, finding ways to challenge the status quo, which I think everybody here can probably relate to in uh, some degree. Um, I'm also autistic, uh, which shapes my view of the world in a particular way that I will share more about. So my goal in this is to explore the framing in which we think about and talk about accessibility as it relates to these different forms of technology. Uh, yesterday, in our breakout session about XR and data, we talked about how spatial computing and artificial intelligence is an enabling technology as a form of context sharing and taking what somebody knows in their field of expertise and sharing that with others, uh, which we've been doing here uh, over the past two days. I'm not sure about all of you, but to me, there's a lot to juggle in my mind right now, thinking about how rapidly these technologies are evolving. Uh, and my, my hope here is that this presentation can provide a framework or vocabulary for how we talk about this. Uh, there's a principle in thermodynamics that I've been leaning on recently that you can only introduce more chaos into a system. Uh, the role that I try to play and hope to do at least a little bit today uh, is to rally that chaos into um, action and a way of framing as we continue to share the way that our individual and lived experiences from our ways of interacting with the world uh, shape and interact with these new computing paradigms. Uh, so I said I would share my bold vision for the future. Um, my bold vision for the future is that software looks very different than it does today. And what we uh, are able to do over the course of the coming years with spatial computing and artificial intelligence is that we're able to create private personal agents that allow us to generate our own frameworks and interfaces for navigating human and computer interaction and context in a way uniquely suited to the individual grounded in human agency and utilizing machine learning and spatial computing technologies. Uh, so what if, to support this bold vision for the future, digital literacy involved teaching fundamental computer science skills so that building a software application, a browser, or an operating system could be as personal as waking up in the morning and as easy as waking up in the morning? Uh, what if artificial intelligence makes it possible to build homegrown software from the operating system up at scale so that this is something that's available to everyone? And what if we think of AI as augmenting intelligence rather than creating something othered 
or artificial. So multi-dimensional computing. This is a big phrase. Uh, I was surprised when I Googled these two words. There's not a lot out there because I think that it really nicely encapsulates the complexity of working with large data sets that feed into artificial intelligence uh, based programs and into spatial computing very generally. So I'll talk a little bit more about what I mean by this term and if you find it useful, I would invite you to also use it. Uh, so what do I mean when I talk about multidimensional computing? Well, it's a combination of machine learning, which very fancy statistics um, to predict words, images, uh, and un try to understand context, and spatial computing, specifically in how these technologies play together. Um, and why talk about this now? Well, people here all have very unique insights having worked on or actively working on XR technologies to understand where XR and AI, or, and AI converge. Um, I have four places where I can break down technologies to reflect this. Um, we have accounts and social graphs. This can include avatars, the way that we're embodying computers and computer or digital agents. Um, it's at the application and services layer. It's at the operating system and view layer for these applications. And it's at the development of and democratization of unique hardware for input and display. So um, on screen here, I have two lines of pseudocode defining the position of an object in a 3D space. There are three variables. Uh, defining the X, Y, and Z coordinate. And I have a rotation degree, which is a value of 45. What I'm aiming to do here is tell a computer how to rotate a cube 45 degrees around uh, its axis. This, in this case, it's an example. The axis itself doesn't really matter. Um, this is matrix multiplication. You can see just to say I want to rotate this cube 45 degree angles, there's quite a bit of math. Um, and this is three dimensions and the rotation. Uh, what happens if we want to add a time dimension or attach a geographic coordinate to our entity reference? Well, we see an example here of a rotation. The cube has just rotated once. Um, math is hard. <laughs> <laughs> because you can imagine Multi-dimensional computing, spatial computing and AI, uh, offers access to and insights from a massive amount of data, some of which is structured, some of which is unstructured. Um, but at all times, we as humans are measuring and interpreting information in the world around us. With machine learning and spatial computing, some of the examples of this is virtual geometry, like the example I just gave with positional coordinates. Um, but this can also be absolute, or it could be relative. I didn't tell you anything about the coordinate system of that cube. It could be a cube that only exists in the space on my computer. It could be a, a, blo a box that is sitting on the ground in front of me. There's relative context, context to geometry. There's physical and animated characteristics of the objects in the space. There are social components that can be very difficult to measure, but are still quantifiable in some way. Uh, for example, verbal spoken language, which has been mentioned, physical body cues, um, other forms of language and communication that is nonverbal, uh, shared context of what's happening in a space and how each of us has individually constructed a model of the world around us and how we choose to share that model with others. There's data and insights about our physical environment that can help us navigate a space uh, safely. There's ambient audio, which may or may not be adding to or adding chaos, uh, adding clarity or adding chaos to what we're experiencing. There are remote sensors that can feed in data about the atmospheric pressure or temperature or proximity to different devices. Uh, and then there are 
other forms of interactions that can be derived from the relationships between all of this information, uh, which I will generally refer to from this point out as computational understanding, because that's essentially what we're doing with spatial computing and artificial intelligence. We're trying to uh, understand the world around us and communicate that understanding to others. On the slide here, I have three boxes. Each are colored differently. Uh, one box is red and contains the words data and information. One box is blue and contains the words meaning and context. One box is green and contains the words engagement and interaction. There are also six gray arrows. Each arrow connects one box to the other two boxes, and this is bidirectional. Each of these represent various parts of compute and the human experience. Our brains and a database, whether that's local or on the cloud, contain data and information. Spatial computing uses wearable sensors and displays to process data and information from the physical world around us and feeds that into AI-powered algorithms to generate structures and frameworks for that information. Both humans and computers then attribute meaning and context to that data and information. Examples um, that have been discussed are using head-mounted displays in machine learning to understand the space around us. So if you approach a boundary to a VR headset, you know that you are entering an unsafe place in your physical environment. Um, you may see with Apple's Vision Pro, um, the ability to contextually give you a notification that a new person has entered the space. And machine learning uh, and humans use information and the meaning and context about that information. And we generally choose then, how do we want to engage or interact with that? One of the things that's really fascinating to me right now in the discourse around artificial intelligence is how we are ascribing human sentiment to statistics. Um, there was an article recently talking about an, how someone managed to get an alter ego for Bing search engine to fall in love with them. Uh, and this is a really interesting example of ascribing human sentiment to a very, very complicated statistics algorithm. Um, so the arrows on these boxes represent places where components are related, related across various dimensions. Um, an example of this is that one of the earliest examples of an XR app that I found online uh, was a Fidelity stock portfolio VR experience where you would generate a city based on your stock performance and the city height, the building's heights would change based on how well your individual portfolio was doing. Uh, our emotional engagement with that sort of experience is gonna depend a lot on the context of how uh, the stock market's doing, uh, but also in how that information is presented to us. And if it's presented absolutely or relatively relative to the other stocks that are performing and so on. Uh, so thinking about how accessibility fits into all of this, one of the key questions that I'm thinking about right now is who has access to the raw data sources that are being used to define all of these other pieces of the computing stack? Where are lines being drawn and controlled arbitrarily or because it benefits people who have power to keep it that way? Uh, and how does my mental model of the world that I've experienced uh, who study, as an autistic person who studied economics, changed the way that I create meaning and context from a city I'm navigating based on my stock portfolio from someone who has a different experience. Uh, and so now a question for you. How many dimensions was that? Any fans of musical theater in the room? Yeah, a few. Um, so one of the things that I love here is the example of the song from Rent where you're asking how do you measure um, uh, seasons, seasons of love. How do you measure a year in the life of someone else? And they talk about it being 525,600 minutes, 365 days, uh, midnights, uh, cups of coffee. There's a lot of different ways to quantifiably measure a year. And I think that that's a really fun example of that. Uh, but if we go back to the slide um, where we're looking at the dimensions of the way that data and information, meaning and context, uh, and engagement and interaction all relate to one another. Well, we could start with, well, there's six words. Maybe it's six dimensions. 
Um, or there's six word associations and six arrows, and if we multiply those together, we get 36. There's six word associations and six arrows and three colors, which takes that number up to 108, but arguably, does that color mean anything? Not on its own, but what if I tell you that red represents hardware and opportunities to explore the hardware space, blue represents something that happens in a human brain, and green represents UI? Now there's new forms of meaning that can be determined from those relationships. Uh, and like I said here, math is hard. Uh, and one of the reasons math is hard is because we're generally taught there's a right and a wrong way of doing math. There's a right answer, there's a wrong answer. And I have had multiple arguments with people when I really try to insist that you can say that one is equal to infinity if you're crossing dimensions and talking about how one point uh, is equal, or one line is, in, is equal to an infinite number of points. If I'm adding a dimension there, math starts to get weird really fast and creative really fast. Uh, so one of my goals here uh, is thinking through how we shift our framing of AI, spatial computing, XR, uh, to, from a discrete computing paradigm into one that is continuous, probabilistic, and emergent. AI is a statistical average. It's really fancy statistics. If you think about a standard six-sided die and you roll it over and over again, the statistical average of your rolls is going to be three and a half. But you're never going to see three and a half on a six-sided standard die. And if you think about the human population, it's similar. There's no statistical average of a human, and yet we've historically taken a very discrete pro approach to how we think about categoriz categorizations and solutions. Uh, in Jamie's talk just a couple of minutes ago um, on wearing glasses, I couldn't vote because to me that's not a binary question. It's not yes or no, it's what's the context. I was a glasses wearer until I got LASIK and I very rarely remember to bring my glasses with me, which is very contextual to whether or not I'm experiencing um, a disability or a disadvantage in that particular context that I'm in. And I love that because it forces this conversation about context and the wide spectrum of participation and the ways that we use computers, because the answer is always going to vary. So one of the things that I'd like to encourage by exploring this concept of multidimensional computing is shifting away from binaries like 2D to 3D, augmented versus virtual versus mixed reality, whether something is accessible or inaccessible, artificial versus human intelligence, or right versus wrong, and thinking about how each of these are points on a spectrum. Um, and on the slide, there is a grayscale gradient where on one side it is white, one side it is black, and in between there are infinite shades of gray. So now I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit about where we've been, and then I'll talk a little bit about where we might be headed. Uh, so I mentioned I was formerly the director of Mozilla Hubs. Mozilla Hubs is an open source platform, an engine for building social 3D worlds. And some of the accessibility features that we've explored in hubs include visualizing audio fall off so that you can see in your space where audio may or may not continue to be heard. Um, we've explored non-physical options for moving around a space. Uh, we've built something that facilitates shared context where the environment itself can dynamically respond to the people and information being shared within it. Uh, it's built on an extensible format, the GLTF format, so that people can embed relevant additional properties to what's happening in that space uh, to aid in the description that makes sense for that particular group of individuals. Uh, it enables the development of nonverbal languages within groups. And for some people, this can be challenging to understand until you've experienced it. But there is, within different groups, a language that will emerge in how people are sharing content, context, jokes, the construction of in-groups and out-groups within various communities. And spatial computing and artificial intelligence really allows people to develop their own languages and contexts that are shared amongst various groups of people. Uh, and lastly, on this slide, uh, Mozilla Hubs also supports existing tools and uh, infrastructure for 
accessibility um, in different ways that can be applied to these dynamic environments. And these slides, which I'll share out, have some additional links to more uh, spaces where you can read or learn more about what's been done. Um, one example that I'll call, uh, call out here is because Hubs is open source, you, different communities can actually build their own interfaces into the um, environments that are being built. So uh, Equal Entry built a custom Hubs client that allowed uh, people to author scene descriptions so that the, the experience could be um, more compatible with screen readers and so that people in the space who were cited could actually add additional context and details for those who were not. Um, Equal Entry has also done some research and experiments to embed captioning services that already exist into the media within these spaces to transcribe verbal communication um, by other users. Um, this is a screenshot of a 3D space that has a 3D object of a red chair, uh, very comfortable looking if I might say so, in the corner of a 3D room. And this is an example of one of the first experiments that I did into accessibility for 3D environments and utilizing machine learning. And what this was doing was taking snapshots of the 3D experience, sending them to um, Microsoft's, at the time, Cognitive Services API, and trying to generate captions from the scene. And what this did was showed a very early, not exactly useful prototype of a tool that could tell me I was looking at a red chair. But it doesn't tell me that there's a paper under the red chair, and it doesn't tell me that the room is empty right now, and there's a lot of context and meaning that was not uh, given as part of this demo. But it was one of the places where um, I was able to see the capabilities of machine understanding as it relates to spatial technology. So I think that it's worth calling out here. Um, this is also something that we continue to see in 3D environments, is looking at the balance of human-generated captioning and giving context to these spaces um, and where it may be appropriate to use machines to do this. So where might we be headed? This slide has quite a bit of text. It's written, or it's designed in such a way as to replicate a computer terminal where it is a black rectangle with white text that reads, generate me a large gallery room. Populate the room with posters that link to the most recent articles published by the ACM. Create a digital agent who can answer questions about all of the articles. Each poster should have a description about the content and link to the article author's website or LinkedIn profile. Do any of the papers talk about advancements in quantum computing? If so, summarize that paper for me. We are not that far off from this being a realistic way to talk to a computer to get it to build you something. Um, on this slide, I've used colors to emphasize specific phrases. A large gallery room. Most recent articles published by the ACM a digital agent who can answer questions about all the articles, a description about the content, the article author's website or LinkedIn profile, for me. So on this screen, there are now two examples of uh, content that would fit this prompt. On one side, it is a stark white room. The gallery is very minimal. On the other side, there's a dim, colorful room. The gallery has much more ambient tone to it. Um, under the stark white gallery, there's a link to the ACM, the Association of Computing Machinery. On the right, it's ACM Country, the Academy of Country Music Awards. Um, a digital agent for the gallery on the left might be in the style of Grace Hopper, whereas a digital agent in the style on the right might be Dolly Parton. Uh, and one of these cases will probably have papers about quantum computing and the other one probably not. Um, and so when I think about where we're heading and the importance of private agents that understand our context and evolve with us, I think of two personas. One persona is Liv. Hello. Liv is capable of verbal speech. Uh, Liv prefers academic research papers to learn about new topics. 
she has a context of computer science. She wants visual information as an input. She synthesizes data primarily with words, either spoken or written. I write a lot of long blog posts that ramble. Uh, and a lot of the times I'm interacting with computing on a tablet. The second persona up here is Ori. For Ori, verbal speech capability is inconsistent. Ori prefers artistic and abstract representations of ideas. Ori has a lot of musical context. Her thoughts are often song lyrics or melodies playing in her head. Ori wants hands-on practice to, to synthesize information. And she synthesizes data primarily with visuals that are not words. And Ori likes to engage with information through a spatial headset interaction. And both of these are me. Right now you're getting live. Um, but within me there exists another discrete persona that I've tried to calculate here, as well as many, many others, because it's not a binary. It's very flexible based on my context and what I've experienced in a particular day, where I am, what kind of computing technology is available to me. And when I think about where we're headed, what gets me really excited is how we can dynamically be generating computing experiences that work for us as individuals. Um, Langview is an example of a project where um, we've built an open source code generation tool that utilizes OpenAI's API and YAML files to define our own UI components that can then be used to construct responses from AI language prompts. So rather than having a chatbot interface where the prompt is returning text, this is actually an open source library where you can define custom components that are UI for use in the AI generating content that is contextually relevant. Um, and because it's open source, ideally, people can write their own components that work for them. Um, another example of this and how it relates to spatial computing is starting to look at the diffusion technologies that are being used to generate 3D assets from text. Uh, this slide contains a screenshot of uh, Google Dream Fusion 3D's website where um, it shows images of 3D models that have been generated from a text prompt. Uh, and this site is not accessible to screen readers. There isn't alt text on the images that are being displayed here. Um, and one of the big challenges that we're facing in AI and spatial computing right now is that so much of it is moving very quickly and we're starting to feed data and inputs into systems we don't fully understand and that data is not necessarily going to be sufficient for helping computers understand the accessibility needs of the people who are using them. So how do we ensure that generative AI is accessible? I brought up the four topics of accounts and social graphs, applications and services, the operating system and view layer, and unique hardware for input and display. And a couple of the ideas um, that have come up is making sure that we are building accessible methods and that's going to be different and again, heavily contextual for the experience, for the person, for the people that that person is with in distinguishing digital AI agents from humans. Um, at the applications and services layer, it's ensuring that we are training code gen models on accessible websites and providing tools for building personally accessible um, applications in a way that shifts from um, existing paradigms that may or may not be being implemented right now and into fundamentally rethinking the way that software development as a field is still currently locked behind so many gates. Um, those arbitrary lines that I talked about earlier uh, come into play. And I say arbitrary not to dismiss the vast amount of work that people do um, in order to ensure that their experiences are accessible um, or that their work is accessible, but because so many of the systems in our physical world and our societal reality um, are not taking into the spectrum, uh, taking the spectrum into consideration, but are instead trying to make things very discreet. There are a lot of places where the value exchange systems that we've built don't enable 
us to slow down um, and continue to introduce chaos. And so, hence, um, my attempt at synthesizing some of this information. Um, and lastly, this is an ambitious one, but I think that given sufficient motivation and time spent on solving these problems, um, we are starting to see room for space and opportunity built on open, collaborative, open source principles to create space for uh, increasing the accessibility and availability of building homegrown spatial devices from the operating system up. Uh, it's a very ambitious goal, but I mentioned it's an ambitious goal for the future here. Um, and I see this as being a strong vision for how spatial computing and artificial intelligence together will allow us to build a truly personalized computing experience where our information, our lived context, and our lived experiences um, are what is feeding that information, that it's staying private and it is staying safe so that it accounts for the ethical concerns around the misuse of that data and information. Um, and that we're really able to focus on in the coming years, working in these spaces, making sure that information and access to data is available to everyone uh, from the very beginning. And we are not doing that right now with much of what's happening in the AI space. Um, so I wanna call out to remember here, AI on its own will not fix accessibility. This is a, the blog title from a blog post that Adrian Rosselli wrote um, a couple weeks ago where he calls out accessibility is about people. It is not a strictly technical problem to be solved with code. It is not the approximation of human-like ramblings produced by the complex algorithms generally rebranded as AI. Um, you know, I think that there's a lot of potential in this space, but what I encourage folks to do from this presentation is think about how we can continue to break from the binary um, and, and the assumptions that we've made at the computer science level and programming level uh, to question what is being done right now in spatial computing and AI and how much agency that we can have in building a future for computing that looks very different and much more um, uniquely personalized to each person moving forward. Um, and so with that, for folks who are local or interested in traveling back to New York City uh, in the next couple of weeks, I'm getting ready to launch um, an event where we talk about AI 3D um, in advance of the Hugging Face AI Game Jam. Um, that will be on July 6th, and I will invite folks here. I'll share links in the Slack when that um, event bright goes live. Um, but now I think we've got a little bit more time for questions anybody would like to ask anything. I, I guess this is more just a comment um, th that uh, I was really struck by um, uh, the personalization approach uh, that you're mentioning and kind of bringing that into some conversations from yesterday about how challenging it can be to produce, as a creator, produce content that is sufficiently accessible to the infinite variability of what people need and what how they prefer to consume content and what, what is meaningful and evocative and contextually relevant to their way of perceiving the world. And that this approach really um, seems to address that because people get to create their own uh, preference in the way that they consume and then the the content is uh, consumed that way. I, it, uh, a lot of light bulbs of just the way that you've articulated this as a, as you said, ambitious um, future state of how to solve for that challenge of, of building kind of ultimate inclusivity. Yes. Um, I, just really, really cool stuff, so thank you. Yeah, thank you. I, I think that that's exactly right. You know, the, we have accepted so much of our software development stack as being complex, which it is, I'm not saying it's not, it's very complex, complex problems. Um, but fundamentally what is still happening is companies, because of their fiduciary responsibility to their stakeholders, are not encouraged to share data, not encouraged to share this information, um, not incentivized to make it easy for everybody to go build their own operating system or their own hardware. And I think that um, one of the things that I'm trying to do uh, today and 
in my work moving forward is challenge those assumptions and help rally the communities who are ready to challenge those assumptions to figure out how we really do make that work because we all have our own personalized computing environments. We have our own personal and unique views of the internet and the information that we experience that um, finding ways to rethink the things we take for granted in tech and how we work with software, I think is gonna be really key in the next couple of years. Hi, so my question relates to journalism being taken into AI for recontextualization, because a lot of that then has a, not just been journalism, but people who are telling their own stories they want to maintain a degree of control and truth around the context, but AI can do a lot to help recontextualize for different uh, ways of, of input output uh, mm -hmm. for people's needs. Um, what, coming from Mozilla, what type of systems or standards do we think we need that uh, in the AI ecosystem to ensure um, less hallucination along the path from uh, the creator to the receiver? Yeah, um, I think there's a lot that we can do that we've, or I should say, folks who have a lot of power in the AI space right now have said is too difficult to do or impossible to do. Um, auditing and being transparent about data sources is one thing that I think many more companies can do as they're talking through their foundation models um, and just being very open about what, where they've trained that data from. A lot of people aren't saying that because it's gonna make a lot of people mad if they do and they find out where their data has been used. Um, in terms of what I see as being you know, directly re relevant to um, journalism, as you, you since you mentioned that, um, is building better and more accessible tools around working with massive data sets. Um, and in fact, there's an open source community project called Dataset, uh, data S-E-T-T-E dot I-O. Um, and the creator of that is looking to solve exactly those problems. How do we encourage people to become better at auditing their own information and what they're creating and what they're publishing and share out those um, sources and be able to work with more and more data um, that maybe previously was not necessarily blocked off to access, but not as easily available. Um, and I think as we culturally start to shift from I'm gonna read this article from a trusted source and consider that to be the extent of my probing into the validity of that information. Um, I think that tools enabled by AI, um, but keeping in mind that we also need to change human behavior can go really far. So thinking about open sourcing those tools, um, building those communities, taking a very shared approach to problem solving um, can go a long way in helping with the transparency and validity of information. Uh, while also recognizing that ground reality, I don't think actually exists the way that I thought it was, like, was taught it was. Um, and the more that we can get comfortable with that ambiguity and context, the better. Thank you. All right, well, thanks so much, Love. Let's get a round of applause for that amazing presentation.